Okay, welcome everyone, and thank you for attending our monthly College of Natural Sciences webinar. My name is Alison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And through this Pilina Ao webinar series, we're aiming to reach the broader community and share the world-class research that happens here within the College of Natural Sciences, but also across the Manoa campus. Today's presentation features Dr. Megan Porter, who's an associate professor in the School of Life Sciences here in the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Dr. Megan Porter is an associate professor in the School of Life Sciences, and after completing an MS degree at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, a PhD at Brigham Young University in Utah, a postdoc at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and several years as an assistant professor at the University of South Dakota, she joined the faculty here at the University of Hawaii in 2015. Megan is a visual ecologist and an evolutionary biologist who studies the way animals see the world. Her research is focused on the molecular aspects of vision in a range of animals, including flies, worms, shrimp, and birds. As a researcher of animal vision, Dr. Porter is especially interested in the intersection between science and art and how understanding the visual systems of other animals alter our own perception of the world. And so now I'd like to turn the time over to Megan for her presentation on light, vision, and perception, studying how animals see the world. Welcome, Megan. Thank you so much. And aloha to everyone. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your day um, to join us. Um, let me just get my talk going. All right, um, everyone can see that okay? Okay. That's me, sorry. <laughs> okay. So um, what I'm gonna tell you about today, um, uh, as was introduced, is, is my research, a bit about my research into understanding how animals see the world. Um, and my lab in particular really studies the evolution of animal vision, uh, both in form and function, uh, and really investigates the diversity of animal visual systems. There's a lot to learn about how animals interact with and perceive the world around them. Uh, I've divided my talk into three sections. Uh, I'm gonna start off with an introduction to light. The light environment is really critical to understanding animal visual systems, and it has a large role. It sets the constraints of vision, right? Um, what colors of light are available in the environment um, dictates how a visual system can work. Um, then I will get into sort of the area where my research is mainly focused, and that's the actual evolution of the anatomy, the physiology, the molecular components of vision. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the diversity of studies uh, that are going on in my lab right now. And then I wanna end up and wrap up with just the idea of perception. So there's a lot that we can do to study the way visual systems work. Understanding the perception of all that visual information is a, is a um, fun thing to think about, but a hard thing to actually study. So we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So I wanna start first with light and thinking about light, both in how we as humans interact with the world, what we see, and also what um, visual scientists like myself, how we characterize light and the, the intersection between those two. Um, I am, let me see if I can get, uh-oh, let me turn my laser pointer off quick so I can see my quote. Um, there we go. Uh, for each section, I'm going to, sort of start with a quote. Um, and this helps, I think I'm a, a collector of quotes uh, related to light and vision. Uh, they help me, um, I find them fascinating that that link between light as a, as a property that we study and the color that we perceive. Um, and so for this section, uh, a quote by an artist, Cezanne, light is a thing that cannot be reproduced, but must, must be represented by something else, by color. So in the context of the talk, um, I'm really going to be using light and color interchangeably. But they're two very different things, right? Color is a perception 
it's individual. We all have slightly different visual systems, um, are both in the way we detect light and the way that our brains process them. Um, so it is hard to tell whether one person's blue is the same as another person's blue. So in science, we want to quantify the light that we are looking at. So the visible spectrum, the colors that we see are part of an electromagnetic spectrum that um, spans from very, very tiny wavelengths to very, very long wavelengths. But when we're talking about vision, we're talking about just the wavelengths that um, are the right size to interact with human tissue, with biological structures. And we call that um, the visible spectrum. And that's a very tiny portion of that electromagnetic spectrum. And we tend to associate wavelengths. We, we characterize light by the wavelengths, um, sort of from violet, which are smaller, to red, which are longer wavelengths. Um, and we, but we, those are associated with colors. So the longer wavelengths are the reds that we perceive, the shorter wavelengths are the blue to violet that we perceive. Um, and then we get, once we get out of that, the wavelengths are either too long or too short um, to be detected. So you'll hear me talk about color um, throughout this talk, but just understand that when I say a color, there's an underlying uh, quantification of that, that wavelength so that we can um, be precise in a scientific context. So you may um, hear me go back and forth about that, but when we're talking about wavelengths, um, we're talking about in the you know, 400 to 700 nanometers. Um, and I was trying to find a good way to describe how small this is. So think about the um, width of soap in a bubble. So that is the scale we're talking about. Very, 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 very small. And uh, if you blow soap bubbles. Um, so if we, we think about light environment, so we live here in Hawaii, um, many of us, and so we're familiar with the ocean. The ocean is blue. If you're a diver, you're very familiar with being immersed in that blue environment. I um, mean, this, I think, uh, aquatic systems, marine systems, clear ocean water is a good place to start in thinking about light environment. Because the water itself has um, properties that uh, absorb and scatter light so that as you go deeper in the ocean, you lose wavelengths of light. Um, and in particular, the deeper you go, the more long wavelength or red and the more short wavelength or ultraviolet and violet um, are scattered and absorbed. So the deeper you go, the more, um, the only light that is left is blue. So as you descend in the ocean, light gets dimmer and it gets bluer. And that has a, a big impact on visual systems, right? The, the light available and how they evolve within um, that environmental light spectrum. Um, as an example of this, I found this really fun video uh, from PBS. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, I think these are marker caps um, on a wire. And at the top there is what those colors look like at the surface and then a video of how those colors change with depth um, as you dive into the ocean. So notice um, particularly the longer wavelengths, the reds, orange, and yellows. See, darn it, hit the wrong button. Get that going again. The, um, the reds, orange, and yellows, right? So even once you get down to about 20 feet, um, you notice that you're starting to lose uh, that, that red color is already starting to change, right? Um, and the deeper you go, the less red light there is, which means that you can no longer see that color. Uh, so in particular, that red cap, there's no longer any red light. It starts to look black. The yellows and oranges start to look green. The purple starts to look blue, right? As there's less and less red light. So that's just one demonstration of how the light environment affects uh, one, what is able to be detected, which impacts visual systems. Another sort of biological example of this is a study that Sanka Johnson did. Um, he's done a, a number of studies about pelagic organisms in the ocean. Um, and if you look at things towards the surface of the water where there's um, the full spectrum of, of color, they tend to be transparent or um, silvery, which acts as a mirror to reflect those wavelengths. 
Um, but the deeper you go, the more you see things that are either black or red, um, with red being um, at depth with no red light, the same as being black. Um, so it's a form of camouflage in the deep sea. So animals evolve within these, these light environments. Um, they're constrained by the light that is available, both in what they can see um, and, and also um, you know, the, how they, their visual systems are set up. And just as a demonstration, again, if you're a diver, you may have been diving in either coastal waters or freshwater lakes. Um, I think, believe this is from a Great Lake. Um, and you are aware of the color differences in bodies of water based on um, either what nutrients are in there, um, the, or sediment, um, or this is an example of a, a picture from um, Australia um, where there's a lot of organic material in the water. Um, and just for comparison, where there's lots more stuff in the water, light attenuates much quicker over a much smaller range of depths. And it has a big impact on the light available as you um, descend in that, that water. Um, if we move to terrestrial systems, the, the, we have the same sorts of constraints by light environment. Um, we live in the terrestrial environment. We are well aware of the changes in light from day to night. Um, or a, moon, a full moon at night versus just stars. Um, so we, we're aware of the big changes in intensity, um, the amount of light available, but there are also, again, spectral differences between times of day. So as an example of that, um, here again is a two uh, spectra side by side to show um, the light from the sun versus the moon. And the big thing to notice here is that there's a big difference in intensity but also uh, the reflected light from the moon has a much higher percentage of the shorter wavelengths, the blues and violets. So the light available, even the terrestrial realm uh, changes depending on time of day and um, whether you're an open habitat or a forested habitat, et cetera. And thinking about light environment um, is important. A really big area of study um, more recently is thinking about natural light versus artificial light. Um, so this is a view that, that should be familiar to most people um, of Waikiki at night um, with a full moon. Um, so it's very bright out, but notice that uh, the lights from the, the, the bustling you know, um, hotels and streets um, are just as bright as that natural illumination. Um, and that causes a lot of problems for anything that is evolved to um, navigate or move around the world uh, in dim light nocturnal environments. Um, so that is something that uh, there's a big area of research now about how this affects different types of animals. Um, if we zoom out a little bit from Waikiki and look at all of um, the Hawaiian Islands, this is a map of, of light at night from Google Earth, just to give you an idea of, of the, the scope of light pollution on the islands. And um, there's active research in the lab right now, which I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. Um, so we are, um, I have a graduate student who's working on aspects of this idea of light pollution um, by studying the visual systems of seabirds. So I'll get to that in just a minute. So with that, um, as an introduction to light and light environment, how that light environment can vary across different environments and how that can impact um, both how animals uh, choose to camouflage themselves in different environments, but also then it's gonna have a large impact on the evolution of their visual systems. So this next section is really where my research um, lies in terms of um, studying the evolution of the form and function of animal eyes. Um, and the quote that, that I think I think of often uh, in this research uh, is by Arthur uh, Schopenhauer, in that every person takes the limits of their own field of vision for the limits of the world. So we're very visual creatures. Um, you know, our vision uh, informs how we in, interact with the world around us but it is limited uh, in a lot of ways compared to the way that animal visual systems work. So thinking about how other animal visual systems um, detect light and how animals use that information um, is a way to sort of gain, uh, expand the way that you view the, um, your own world by seeing your own limitations. 
So I want to start off here um, with the way our own visual system is set up. Um, and so this may look familiar to you if you've ever been to the eye doctor. Um, this is a, a schematic of our own eyes. Uh, we're called, we have camera type eyes, which means that we have um, a lens um, at the front of the eye that focuses light onto the back of the eye, onto a retinal layer. Um, and that retinal layer is really um, where the light sensitive portion of this whole uh, visual system lies. In our eyes, light comes in, is focused by that lens onto the retina in the back, and the retina in the back has what we call photoreceptor cells, cells that contain, um, that are sensitive to light. And those cells uh, contain opsin proteins, um, which are uh, in combination with a light sensitive chromophore, the visual pigments in all animal visual systems. So it doesn't matter what sort of eye you have, um, fundamentally, the thing in that visual system that's detecting light is a, a visual pigment composed of an opsin protein. So in our visual system, we have a, a trichromatic visual system. So we can detect uh, blue, green, and red light. We have three different types of cells um, for those uh, different colors. And each of those cells um, expresses a different opsin protein. Um, that is sensitive to that part of the visible spectrum. So with that as an introduction to our own visual system, again, uh, I want to now broaden out to the diversity of animal eyes um, that are um, around, because um, even just from this uh, collage of just the external eyes, you can see how diverse they are in um, external morphology. They're also highly diverse in the anatomy of those eyes, both in terms of how light is focused onto those um, cells that can detect light. Um, there's our camera eye here. Uh, arthropods have compound eyes. So each individual facet is an individual unit that focuses light onto um, light sensitive cells. Uh, cephalopods have camera type eyes, but they're put together completely differently from the way that ours are. Uh, scallops have eyes with lenses and two layers of receptor cells. So there's a huge uh, diversity in the anatomy of the way eyes are put together. And, and just some of my favorite examples um, for things that maybe you were not aware had eyes. Uh, so box jellies, jellyfish have eyes. Um, on each corner of that box-shaped bell, there's a little structure called uh, a ropalia. And each one of those has six different eyes in it, including things with lenses and, and photoreceptive layers. Um, so that, uh, and they use those to um, orient themselves in the water and, um, a lot of these are associated with mangroves, so to uh, keep within the habitat, their preferred habitat. Um, another thing that maybe you weren't aware had eyes are starfish. So at the, at the end of each of those arms, at the very tip here, there's a structure with photoreceptive cells and um, studies have shown that if they get washed off a reef, they can use those to navigate back to reef structures. Um, so there's a huge, diversity of animals that have eyes, um, many of which maybe you weren't aware of before. Um, and evolutionarily, um, all of this diversity goes back uh, to the Cambrian explosion. So this period in, in history and geologic time when um, there was this explosion of diversity of forms. Um, and there are hypotheses out there that some of this um, sort of ex explosion of, of evolution was driven by the evolution of eyes. So um, right at the beginning of that, um, animals started to evolve eyes. You get the first uh, apex predator showing up, um, and then it becomes an arms race between things that can now see their prey and capture them efficiently, and prey that now need to figure out ways to escape that. Um, so, so there are hypotheses out there that the evolution of eyes have, have driven really the diversity of animal, um, animals that we see today. All right, so that's the diversity of animal eyes. Let me get a little more into um, what's go what happens in my lab. So 
as I said, my lab is really focused on the evolution of visual systems. Um, and most of the studies in my lab start off by looking at the molecules. So looking at those ops and proteins. And we can learn a lot about animal visual systems simply by looking to see what ops and proteins are expressed in the eyes, because we can um, get a hint at what wavelength of light, what colors each visual system can detect simply by looking at the sequences of those proteins and of those genes. Um, and as I've already mentioned, uh, my lab studies a diversity of things because it doesn't um, really matter what the visual system looks like, what, how the eye is put together. All animal eyes are based on the light detection ability of this um, opsin protein um, as a visual pigment. So we study things um, as diverse as seabirds, jumping spiders, mantis shrimp, um, marine worms, uh, copepods, decapods, um, a whole variety of things, um, asking questions about how particular eyes have evolved, what their capabilities are, how animals are using that information to interact with the world around them. So in this section on vision, um, I really wanna give you um, four, I guess, vignettes about the types of studies that are happening in the lab, just to give you a broad overview of um, some of the the research that we're doing um, and a broad overview of some of the diversity of questions that we're asking surrounding around the evolution of animal vision. Um, so the first study uh, I want to tell you about is to go back to those seabirds. Um, and there's uh, active research in the lab right now on understanding the visual systems in endangered Hawaiian seabirds. Uh, and this is all work of uh, um, Hannah Moon, who's a PhD student in the lab. Um, so I wanna recognize that this work is hers and all of the um, institutions that have supported the research. And I wanna start off by telling you um, a little bit of background first about how bird visual systems differ from ours. That's our reference point. Um, as I've already explained, we have three cone cells. Um, uh, three types of cone cells, uh, one sensitive to blue, green, and red light. Birds have four cones. So therefore, um, and that fourth cone is in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So it's outside the wavelengths that we can see. Um, but that means that they can see more colors than we can. Um, it's also important to note, I think at least, um, in the broader context of understanding bird vision, there's this idea out there that, that birds have highly con, uh, conserved visual systems. They all have four cones. Uh, those can vary a little bit in what colors of light they can detect. Um, but overall, relative to other animal systems, they're pretty consistent from species to species. The, um, I think the impetus for this study um, is very conservation oriented. Uh, seabirds globally are threatened um, due to light pollution. They are, uh, many of them uh, fly at night and um, particularly the juveniles uh, get confused by lighting around populations um, to artificial lights. Um, they come in, they land, and then they become susceptible to being hit by vehicles or dogs or any other um, number of threats. Um, so, so this this light pollution issue is is a um, you know a big contributing factor to the sort of worldwide decline um, that we're seeing in seabirds. Yeah. So there's one on the ground there that has landed near some artificial lights. Um, so Hana's work really is aimed at understanding the visual systems of uh, Hawaiian seabirds um, to help with figuring out um, conservation management, appropriate conservation management for these, these birds. Um, so if they're attracted to light, the first thing we have to understand is how their visual system works before we can try to come up with management strategies for how to design better lighting systems they might not be attracted to. Um, it's also important to note that uh, across Hawaiian seabirds, light attraction varies. So that also suggests that there's not a one size fits all um, solution to uh, conservation management in some of these species. 
Um, a lot of the, there, are, there is some visual information out there for related seabirds. Um, and a lot of the strategies are based on that, but if there's variation across these species, um, then those may be missing, those, those sort of conservation strategies may be missing the mark for one species or another. Um, and I should, should note that these are um, uh, endangered and vulnerable species, um, again, uh, in part due to this light attraction. So from uh, Hana's studies, um, I'm not gonna get into the, the nitty gritty details of what she's been doing, but in general, um, she has been characterizing the strength of response of seabird eyes to different wavelengths of light. And this gives us a clue to how um, their visual systems are functioning um, and what wavelengths of light really they are paying attention to in a physiological sense. Uh, so this graph shows the strength of response for each species um, to long wavelength light, blue light, and ultraviolet light. Um, the species are color coded, gray, red, and black. Um, and the thing to note that is that they all have fairly similar responses to blue light, but their response strength of response is very different both in the long wavelength and ultraviolet portions of the spectrum. So again, this suggests that um, you know, is tied to that difference in light attraction, perhaps. Um, it challenges the idea that color vision in birds is highly conserved and that, so if you know one bird visual system, you know them all and therefore you can base um, management strategies on that. Um, and it suggests that we need to think a little more carefully about um, each individual species and how their visual systems are working when we think about conservation strategies. Uh, and as she, her work continues, um, the goal is to be able to characterize enough of the visual system to begin to do visual models, which um, are our best way to understand what a bird sees um, and might be paying attention to. Uh, so uh, she's started to do things like using that information to model what artificial lights versus natural lights look like to a bird visual system. Um, and where you know we might see things as differently, they might see things as the same, um, including how artificial lights might be looking similar to the moon. Um, so there are some um, additional characterizations we need to do here for each individual species, but it's this sort of visual model um, that she's hoping to get to, to really have um, some power to be able to say um, how different species are gonna react to any given change in lighting. Okay, so uh, moving from flying terrestrial things to um, where most of my work is centered, which is around invertebrates, insects, crustaceans, spiders. Um, the second vignette I wanna tell you about is um, work that the lab is doing on the evolution of color vision in jumping spiders. Um, if you've never uh, looked closely at a jumping spider, they're fairly charismatic for um, an invertebrate. They will interact with you, they will track you, um, they're, they are, uh, can be very cute as I will show you in a, I will argue anyway, that they are very cute. I'll show you in a minute. Um, I again, want to acknowledge all of the people involved in this work. This is an NSF gr uh, funded grant, um, with a lot of collaborators, um, internationally. Um, so I want to acknowledge all of their contributions. Um, and moving from birds, which have, you know, two eyes on their head, which is a, a sort of a more similar visual system to ours, to spiders, we now have to consider the fact that they've got a lot of eyes and what each of those sets of eyes are doing. So if you've never looked closely at spider eyes, they have uh, four pairs of eyes or eight eyes total in general. Um, and we, they tend to have a set of um, front facing eyes that we call the anterior median, they have anterior lateral eyes, posterior median, and posterior lateral. I'm gonna use this coloring scheme throughout just to help you track all of those different eye types. Um, and if you think about all of these eyes, different sets of eyes are pointed in different directions. So jumping spiders use their um, anterior median, the yellow pairs of eyes that are big and front facing. These are high spatial resolution eyes. Um, 
and they can, rather than moving their eyes like we do, they can move their retinas to look around the world. Um, the, the anterior median and anterior lateral in combination give them a very wide field of view, front facing. These are predators, they hunt things. And then the eyes on the back side of the head, the posterior eyes give them in total um, an almost 360 degree view of their world. So they have clearly eyes devoted to different visual tasks. Um, there's still a big question of how all of the visual information from these different sets of eyes are processed, um, which is a big open question if anyone would like to study that. Um, but where our research lies is more in jumping spider visual ecology. So here's the part where I convince you that jumping spiders are charismatic and cute, um, but they are also um, really diverse in coloration visually. So here's just a few examples of those species that have um, red and blue coloration on their faces. Um, this one, one of my lab members calls the walking Cheeto because it's bright orange. Um, this one here is a peacock spider from Australia. So this is this fan shaped colored structure is um, their abdomen, which they flip up and wave during courtship displays. So they're really diverse. Um, many species have developed these really striking visual signals often displayed in courtship. Um, the question, um, one of the questions that we're trying to answer in this research is, you know, has there been the independent evolution of color vision um, and expanded color vision in these species where we also see these really colorful or, um, ornaments um, used in displays? The approach that I'm taking to do that is again, to look back at those opt-in proteins. So we can learn or we can make guesses about what colors they can detect based on the opt-in proteins that are present. And in the spiders, we have this added complexity of, we have to figure out what opt-ins are present. And once we do that, we then have to figure out what eyes each of those opt-ins is expressed in. Um, so it's a two-step process. And hopefully that those patterns of where options are found in the different eyes are going to give us additional clues to um, what visual tasks they're using those different pairs of eyes for um, and what they're paying attention to in the world around them. So what we have found so far, I think we have sequenced over uh, 25 species of jumping spiders now. And in general, most jumping spiders have three visual options. Uh, one that is sensitive to green light, one that is sensitive to blue light, and one that is sensitive to ultraviolet light. So, so they have the potential for color vision, but in order for them to have color vision, all of these options have to be expressed in the same eye. So that was the next step. We know a little bit about expression patterns from previous research uh, on the species Hesarius adonsoni, which um, has an additional ultraviolet sensitive opsin. So it actually has four opsins. And we can look at where each of these opsins are expressed in um, all of the sets of eyes and spiders. So again, we have here each of those sets of eyes, um, anterior median, anterior lateral, posterior median, posterior lateral, colored over here to help you keep track. And then on this side, we have each of those opsins and what eyes they are expressed in. So the forward-facing anterior median eyes have green ultraviolet, they're dichromats. Um, the lateral eyes seem to only express green opsin. Uh, and for some reason, the posterior eyes seem to express blue opsin. So the, the back eyes um, have that added spectral sensitivity. Um, we are still looking at this across all of the species that we're investigating, but we are finding patterns, different patterns of opsin expression across species, even just in the three or four typical opsins that the jumping spiders seem to have. So there's a lot of variation um, in what opsins are in what eyes, which suggests there's variation in the visual tasks they're using those eyes for. Um, we're still untangling that mess, so stay tuned. Um, okay, the third vignette of animal eyes. We're moving into marine systems now. Uh, and that's the evolution of eyes in fanworms. And I like this group um, 
it's work, it work that I do in collaboration with Mike Bach at Lund University in Sweden. Um, and he's really driving the evolution, the studies of how these eyes have evolved. But I like these because they are very, again, a very different visual system than many of the animals that we are familiar with. So if you look at a fan worm, um, the part that's sticking out of the tube, the fan, these are all gills and feeding structures. Whereas the main um, body is protected in this tube down here. So you can't even see the head. Um, but the eyes in these, this group of animals, rather than being on the head, are scattered across their gills. So you've got a really um, wonderful uh, diversity of eyes on a different, uh, evolved in a different tissue type in this group. Um, and in this particular species, each pair of black, black dots that you see on those gills is a set of eyes. So this, there's a really distributed visual system in these species. And if you look across different species, you see different arrangements of eyes across these gill structures. So in some, um, the spirobranchus over here has created some, uh, evolved, uh, has evolved some fairly decent sets of eyes, but it's concentrated those eyes onto two of those gill structures. So it's got um, two eyes, like many animals we are familiar with. Um, this species over here, if you look closely, it's got a bunch of photoreceptor cups that are all lined up together on those gill structures. Um, over here, we have a Christmas tree worm, which um, is a species that you'll see here. And they have these really odd sort of banana-shaped eyes that sit underneath the fan structures. Um, so there's a, a really, uh, just within this group, this array of, of eye types um, that have evolved. If you like the molecular side of that, um, it is interesting because they are using an opsin in their visual systems. Um, and again, these are visual systems evolved out of gill tissue rather than um, heads. Uh, all of those opsins are related to um, vertebrate and insect opsins that are expressed in the brain. So even though they're out on these gill and feeding structures, um, evolutionarily, they've been co-opted from from brain, brain opsins, um, opsins that are used in, in the context of brains and not in the context of vision in other animals. So there's some diversity here, both in types, in terms of the types of eyes and the diversity of eyes, and then also um, the opsins that are being used for those visual structures. And then finally, the fourth vignette, um, and perhaps, um, Truly where my heart lies in terms of visual studies is, is uh, telling you a little bit about the work we're doing with mantis shrimp. Um, if you're not familiar with mantis shrimp, they're probably best known um, for being predators. They, they have very fast strikes. Um, they can be highly colorful. As you can see from this video, they have um, compound eyes up on stalks, um, which can look around the world um, independently. If we go back to our visual system as a reference point, again, trichromatic vision, blue, green, and red, and we compare that to stomatopods, this is what their diversity of receptor cells looks like from their eye. So notice there's a lot more. Um, they have at least 16 different types of um, photoreceptive cells uh, that are sensitive to different wavelengths or colors of light. Notice that they can see wavelengths much longer than we can, as, all, as well as well in um, several types of photoreceptors sensitive to different wavelengths of ultraviolet light. And if we look at the molecular side of their visual system, um, as I've just said, they have 16 different types of spectrally distinct photoreceptors. Um, they express almost twice as many opsins as we thought they might need. Um, based on the model in our visual system, there's a single opsin for each spectrally distinct type of receptor cell. Um, they're doing some interesting things. And this is a pattern that we see in, in many crustaceans um, and some insects as well, where there are many more expressed opsins, these photosensitive proteins, um, than there are receptors. And so 
it suggests there's something going on that we don't fully understand about the, what opsin proteins are doing in visual systems. Another um, thing that we are studying about stomatopod visual systems is the development. So this image shows uh, a sand burrowing species, uh, Elysia squalina. Um, these are the giant eyes of the adult just picking, uh, poking out of the burrow. I mean, this is an entire larvae of that species, early stage larvae. So you can see there's a giant difference in um, the size of the eyes. Uh, there's a difference in complexity of the visual systems as well. Adults live in uh, the bottom and benthic habitats, larvae live up in the water column. And so we have started studying how um, stomatopods get from, how they develop from the simple larval eye into that adult complex eye that I just showed you. Um, this again is work of uh, two PhD students in the lab, uh, Satara and Marissa, who are both finishing up now. Satara has looked at the opsins in larvae and discovered they have about half as many opsins as the adults, but that is still way more than was expected when we started. And Marissa um, has been characterizing uh, in larvae, again, what types of photoreceptors they have. So they have fewer than the adults, but more than, again, more than we expected with at least a three peaks. Um, this is a UV receptor. This is a blue receptor, and this is a, a long wavelength orange receptor. So they can, they have at least three different types of, re of receptors, uh, many more opsins than that. And we are trying to understand how um, evolutionarily and developmentally they can get from this level of complexity to this level of complexity in the adult eye. All right, so with the last few minutes, um, I wanna just uh, end up with talking about perception. And this is the hardest part. So we can um, study what opsins are expressed. We can physiologically characterize what wavelengths of light a visual system can detect. But to really understand what an animal is seeing, we have to, under, we have to know something about the way that information is processed in the brain. So what are all the neurons and connections doing with that information? And here, um, uh, the quote is, your reality is as you perceive it to be. So it is true that by altering our perception, we can alter our reality. So if we go back to human vision, I've said multiple times now, we have trichromatic vision, we have blue, green, and red receptors, but we can see millions of colors. Um, so how do we get from those three color receptors to all of the, the colors that we can see? And that has to do with, with our brain, the, how that information is processed. So even though we don't technically have, say, a receptor to detect yellow light, we can look at a banana and see that it is yellow because our brain takes the information from our green receptor and our red receptor, compares the two, and then says, all right, green is detecting a little bit, red is detecting more, and that relative ratio equals yellow. The same for say violet, we don't have a violet receptor, but we can compare inputs, uh, our brain compares inputs from multiple receptors um, and tells us what that color is. Because of all of this processing that happens to that visual information, um, it also means that we can uh, play tricks on our perception, right? Uh, there's a lot of processing that happens in, in our, our brains as well as other animals um, when, they, when they process visual information. Uh, for example, color constancy. So even though we are detecting wavelengths of light, our brain is putting that into context for us. So if we look at the image on the left, at these blue squares, um, the arrows are pointing to, and the image on the uh, right, these yellow squares, and then we just look at those squares on similarly colored backgrounds, you see that those are um, the exact same color of gray. But in the context of the image, our brain is fooled because it is filling in some of that information for us. It expects to see yellow and blue, and, and so therefore that is what we see. Um, it's color constancy. Um, it's a way to recognize the same color under different lighting conditions. 
Um, you want to be able to say, see a red apple when it's bright out as well as when it's dim. And so our brain processes that information and it does a lot of that compensation for us. But it means that we can um, be tricked when we're looking at visual, visual scenes. And a lot of visual illusions um, take advantage of those sort of uh, processing loopholes in, in our um, brains and the way we process visual information. So, and that is the part that is the hardest to understand about other animals' visual systems. So I just want to end up um, giving you a little bit of a tour through what other animals may be seeing as best we can model it um, to broaden your perspective on how animals view the world. So we think about dogs, they are dichromats, um, blue and green. So the colors that they see um, are on the yellow to blue. Um, part of the spectrum, whereas uh, compared to the rainbow that we see. And again, this all has to do with what they can detect and what we think about the way that information is being processed. So if we were to look at a picture of these really colorful birds, we see those colors. Uh, anything that's a dichromat like a dog is not going to see the same thing. The same thing for birds. Um, because they can see ultraviolet. So if we look at this mina, this is what we see, false colored so that we can get some sense of what birds see the image on the right, taking into account ultraviolet um, reflection off of that plumage. And so there's a whole diversity out there in animal visual systems. Um, and, and it gets harder to model what they might see the more color channels an animal has and trying to understand how that information is processed to the point where it's, it is <laughs> nearly impossible to understand for us to comprehend. And it, although it's certainly fun to try to imagine what something like a mantis shrimp is seeing. So to wrap up, um, I've told you about um, the importance of light um, and the impact it has as sort of the, the overall constraint on the evolution of visual systems. Um, I've told you about um, some of our studies and understanding uh, the evolution of different components of visual system form and function. And I've ended with just um, giving you some thoughts about perception and um, how hard it is to really understand what animals are seeing, although it's, it's awfully fun to try. Um, so I wanna end with a final quote. Um, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And hopefully I've helped you um, expand um, what you see when you look out at the world around you uh, and challenge you to think about what uh, the, the ways that other animals might be perceiving the world around them. Um, so with that, just a final thanks to all the people who've been involved with the research that I presented to you and the people who have funded it. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. That was really great. Really eye-opening. <laughs> no <pun intended. laughs> we will open up for questions. So if anyone would either like to um, put a question in the chat or go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask it directly. Um, if I may, thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, thank you. I was wondering about the spiders that you said uh, that they don't move their eyes or heads, but they actually move the retinas. Do all of the eyes in the, in the jumping spiders move the retinas or only some? And, and how the heck do they do that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a strategy when um, uh, it's only those front, that pair of front eyes that does it. Um, and those are the eyes that have the best resolution, so the, the finest detail view of the world. Um, and they have uh, basically muscles attached to their retina that can shift it back and forth. So um, because their, their eyes are, their, their sort of cornea and lens are focused, or, or sorry, um, stuck in place, unlike ours that can shift around, um, the, they were constrained with what they could move. The only thing left that they could move is the retina. Um, so it only, it happens in all jumping spiders, as far as I'm aware, most jumping spiders. I mean, it's only that pair of eyes, the big pair of eyes that, that face forward. 
And, and you see it in other animals as well. So um, there are tiny little crustaceans in the ocean, uh, copepods, uh, um, if you've ever run into any of those. Some of those have that same, evolved independently, that same sort of strategy for um, being able to look around the world without having a head that is movable. Thank you. Megan, do you know if there's any work that's been done on, you know, fish that live at different depths in the ocean? Do, do they have different options? Yeah, so absolutely. And, and some of the um, sort of founders of visual ecology as a field worked in fish and looking at, at fish visual systems and showed that um, the prediction is in the ocean, the deeper you go, the more um, tuned to blue light a visual system should be. And uh, through those sort of early studies, uh, they found that pattern that they had predicted. Uh, and, but that's just based on physiological measurements. More recent studies, interestingly, of, of deep sea fish have found species uh, that express as many as um, 38 or have as many as different 38, 38 different options and they express some, some like 15 subset of those. Um, so, so deep sea, there's no reason that we would have predicted for deep sea fish to express that many options. Um, the idea is, I think the current hypothesis is that each one of those is tuned to slightly different wavelengths of light. So if, if a species is moving around in the water column, maybe they have the ability to sort of flexibly tune their visual system to the light environment they're in, depending on what depth they're at. Um, or perhaps it's related to detecting bioluminescence. Um, there are a couple, I think, of hypotheses out there, but it was unexpected to find that kind of molecular diversity in visual systems and in the deep sea. So there's still some um, things that we don't understand about the interplay between uh, sort of phys the physiology of a visual system and what's going on the molecular side. Um, there's still some, some mysteries to be unraveled. Thank you, that's so interesting. I was wondering, you know, from that question, um, I was always wondering whether when the whales breach out, whether, you know, so the eyes are tuned to the water density and so they correct the, or they diffract differently in the retina. So when they jump out, they breach, can they see and in, in, in what the forms, do you, I know it's not part <laughs> of the research, but I've had that question. That, that's a really interesting question. I, I haven't thought much about whale vision, to be honest, although I guess I should here. Um, I, I would say probably their visual systems are adapted to see underwater, um, that when they breach, they can see, although probably not very well. It would definitely alter their ability to see and, and the, the difference in refraction between those two media is gonna change probably um, it's like, it'd probably be like taking off glasses, right? It, it changes their ability to focus, um, but they're not out there for very long. So I think it probably isn't, impacts them too much. <laughs> Thank you. There, there are really interesting fish though. Um, I think they're in Australia uh, that, that live at the, there, there are things that live at the surface of, of the water and they have their eyes are sort of, the top half of their eye is designed to see in air so they can see uh, archer fish, so they can spit at insects um, as prey. And then the bottom half of their eyes is designed to see underwater. So there are definitely animals that, that do that well. I don't think whales are one of them though. <laughs> Rob, you've got your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I have one quick question that might be followed by a second question. So would you consider vision to be anything that's sensitive to electromagnetic radiation? Um, no, um, the, so the reason <laughs> that very narrow window of the, the, electromag the full electromagnetic spectrum that we call the visible spectrum. So that, those are the specific wavelengths that are the right size to interact with biological tissues. So anything smaller um, sort of can't be detected and anything longer can't be detected simply because they're the, 
the wrong size for biological structures, if that makes sense. So I, I don't think visual systems, I will say, I don't think in terms of perception and the detection of light shouldn't be affected by parts of the electromagnetic spectrum outside of that range, that visible part of the spectrum. Well, the reason I asked you, this may sound really stupid, but you know, skin detects infrared radiation and ultraviolet radiation, and you do have directionality with it, and you get some idea of distance too, and right. So, you know, I just wondered if you know you could consider skin to be a light sensitive, uh, electromagnetic sensitive detector. Then, so there's there's lots of um, studies of uh, extraocular photopigments. So opsins are not just used in the eye. They're used in many tissues to detect light. Um, they're in those contexts, they are simply detecting whether light is present or not. They can't detect directionality. You don't get any spatial imaging from that. Um, and so that's true. For example, opsins are expressed in the skin of cephalopods and, and uh, possibly used in that dynamic camouflage that they have. Uh, opsins are expressed in uh, the photophores of shrimp um, that have bioluminescence. So it uh, thought that that there's sort of this internal light detection that helps the shrimp regulate the light that they are emitting. Um, so so they are just general light detectors in animal systems. Um, so it is you know having opsins in skin uh, is is common throughout the animal kingdom actually. If that if that gets at your question. Close enough, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Megan? I have another question if nobody else has a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Marianne. <laughs> um, so you said, you said that the jumping ones have like 16 or you know, whatever, eight pairs, yeah, of, of um, eyes. And so it, how is that, are their brains uh, proportionally or do they, um, is the volume or the mass or the weight in their brains, um, you know, bigger on the optical you know, CPU or like, do you see a difference uh, in in that in in animals that have more brain more eyes that they have to process that faster and therefore occupy more and therefore maybe perhaps not do other tasks so good? Yeah. Um. I so I have to say the spiders. I don't know a lot about the way that their neural systems processing centers are, are set up. So I would definitely expect that they would have quite a bit of brain real estate devoted to processing visual information. They've got, you know, four pairs of eyes, eight total eyes sending information in. So they've got to have a way to, to put all of that together. Um, but, but you can learn a lot about animal visual systems by studying their, their, um, their neuroanatomy, the, the visual centers in the brain as well. Um, and there are many people doing that and comparing, you know, things that have lost eyes tend to lose <laughs> the part of the brain that, that processes visual information does tend to shrink, right? That they don't need that real estate for vision anymore. Um, and, and for example, in, in mantis shrimp and stomatopods, uh, one of the hypotheses for why they have so many different types of spectral receptors is that they have tiny brains <laughs> that can't process information quickly. Um, and so they're processing that information very differently than the way we are. So rather than comparing inputs to, to see yellow, they just have a receptor for yellow that goes straight back to the brain and a receptor for green that goes straight back to the brain. Um, and so they're actually, <laughs> this is when these started, studies started to come out, it was sort of mind blowing because we had thought they have all these receptor types. They must see billions and billions of colors that we, we can't even imagine. But it turns out that they're we're worse than discriminating colors than we are because they're not comparing inputs. They just sort of see green, red, blue, but they can't tell green from blue green, right? Um, so the information is processed very differently. And that's that whole trying to understand how that information is processed um, is a big uh, piece in understanding what the animal is actually seeing. And that is the hardest piece to really get at, I would say. That's brilliant. Like, yeah, you know, it's a very simple system. Yeah, it's fast. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what astronomy um, telescope instruments sometimes, um, the better ones are like that, just one yeah. tap, you do that yeah. very well. <laughs> exactly, exactly.
And so you can, you can see that um, when you start to look at the neural processing centers and in stomatopod um, visual, the visual pathway that, that everything just goes straight back. There's no um, sort of crosstalk, very little anyway. Thank you. Good parallel to astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go ahead and wrap up our Q&A session right now. Uh, I'd like to extend a final thank you to Megan for a really wonderful talk. We appreciate you speaking with us today. Um, and also thank our audience for attending. It's good to see you all again. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Our next event is scheduled. So it's going to be held on Wednesday, June 22nd at 2 p.m., our usual time. It's going to be featuring Dr. Eleanor Hegland, who is an assistant professor in our Department of Chemistry. And uh, Dr. Hegland studies the molecular details of how proteins fold. So watch your inboxes for invitations to that event. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. Aloha. Aloha.